Hello there, friends, and welcome. Today, we're going to be making a habitat for the one and only Iguanodon, as suggested by Tomaso. Thank you for your comment, Tomaso. Ask, and you shall receive. So here is the model. You can see as we change it from male to female, it looks like the male has a bit more red on the head in this... Um, in this particular skin maybe that's for display purposes possibly and uh, the second skin we have i think this is my favorite to be honest it's very lush and green i do like the patterns of the stripes on the tail and yeah it looks very very nice i like that and i love these um these spikes on the back these hardened scales you can see there the female looks a little bit less green a bit more brown and possibly a bit more yellow in color and then the last one this one looks like this will be suited to a desert kind of environment and there doesn't seem to be much change there with the male and female uh, but look at those thumb spikes wow they look even bigger than i thought they were so i think we're going to go with this one the green skin so let's get to it so let us begin clear all those trees out the way so we've got a nice blank area to work with and get in our dinosaurs first thing so we can uh, get an idea of how big we need to make the enclosure for them and what i love about these uh this game every single individual you put in is completely unique if you look at the the iguanodon there you may be able to notice many of them are different colors uh, some of the females are shades of brown maybe even some yellows and lighter greens the males seem to be more greeny a bit darker some of them and even the sizes are different as well so it's it's brilliant because every single animal in this game is an individual so you don't feel like it's just a copy and paste it really is good um, and you can see there i put in i think it's about 15 individuals uh, it is believed that iguanodon are highly social creatures so we don't want them to get lonely do we so we're going to make sure that they've got plenty of friends to socialize with and uh, I think even later on I put some more in. I think we get about 30 individuals in the end, so we do have a very large herd for them. So we wanna make sure that this uh, enclosure is very big. Uh, and with Iguanodon, I really did struggle at first to decide what kind of uh, habitat we were going to make for them. Uh, because Iguanodon, uh, lived from the early Cretaceous, uh, sorry, the early, uh, the late Jurassic <laughs> to the early Cretaceous. That's the right way around, getting mixed up there. Uh, but yes, and they didn't just live uh, for a very long time, but they also lived on every single continent. They colonized every single one. So they would have lived in many different habitats. You know, if they're living in North America, the habitat is going to be very different to Africa. It might be more desert-like over there. Uh, Asia might be more uh, forests. If you go further up north, it might be more snowy. So I was struggling which to decide at first, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to go for a bit of a mixture of everything, but I'm going to try and do something based on scrubland because I've not done anything on scrubland yet. So. Um, and what I love about it is that they have a lot of different types of trees. So you have pine trees, uh, you have some pa palm trees, and then some uh, like bush-like trees. So lots of different variations. Uh, but I think they do go together quite well. But I've also mixed in some other trees. Um, you can see that I've gone for some redwoods because I just feel like they uh, work well with the other pine trees that are already in. And we've also even gone for a bit of swamp um, plants as well. We've put some bulrushes in uh, by the by the nice lake that we've given them. So there's plenty of variations of plants for them and uh, lots of different types. But I think they do go together quite well. It doesn't look like it's, uh, you know, too much of a mishmash. 
Um, I, I think if I put anything else in, it may have gone a bit crazy. If we've got some jungle trees in, it could have been a bit much. So I'm just going to stick to these ones for now. But I do think they go together quite nicely, to be honest. Um, so yeah, we've got this lovely lake curving round to the Mirandering River. And now I'm just connecting another river uh, to that lake uh, by a waterfall. So we're just building that waterfall in now. And we've also got at the back there, you can see some lovely uh, whitish rocks, whitey gray rocks. Uh, I do think that they look quite nice actually, that white rock, it's a nice contrast. And we've also gone for some desert warm sand and then blended it in with some uh, tropical sand. So it's a nice, uh, got some light sand and some warm sand. It looks quite nice. And here we're just trying to make that waterfall look like it's splitting into two, cascading down the rocks. Lovely. I really ought to be a uh, waterfall expert by now. The amount of waterfalls I put into my builds, I can't help myself. I always just think, oh, that would be a nice place to put a waterfall. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just trying to find the right place where the water's going to fall down the rocks. Um, it can be quite difficult. Um, but yeah, I, li I like the way this one's splitting into two. Um, but yeah, it took me a few attempts. This is my final attempt. It, it took me a while to try and realize what I was actually gonna build. I took a few practices and thought, yeah, I'll go with this one. Um, so yeah, just putting some rocks around the edges now to make it look like a load of boulders have cascaded down that waterfall. Uh, they've been er eroded by the water. And putting in some, uh, I think they're called Norfolk trees, I think. Uh, these nice pine ones. Um, I do like these ones. Um, another favorite tree of mine. And uh, in this build, we put a lot of these in. And what I've done there is I've put them in uh, growing on the rocks. Um, if you can imagine some cracks and crevices there where the seeds may have fell down um, and bits of soil and stuff have gathered in there. Maybe a bird has brought the seed uh, with its droppings and uh, the plant has got a hold in that, in those cracks with its roots. Uh, oh, just put a nice log there that may have tumbled down uh, further up uh, river, come falling down the waterfall. But yeah, I like the way those uh, trees look on those on those uh, rocks. I think it looks rather nice. And now we're just going to put in some nice pine trees and also some lower shrubs, some nice ferns on the ground um, to give the iguanas a nice variety of vegetation to feed off. Uh, because not only would they eat off the ground, they can actually raise themselves up to stand up on their two feet. And they can become quite tall doing this, so they would feed um, possibly off low branches, off other trees. Um, and you do actually see them do this in the game. Um, they stand up and they roar. Uh, it's quite great to watch. Um, oh, and here we're going to put in a fallen tree. Um, just to add a little bit of um, character to the forest. Um, obviously all the trees wouldn't be uh, just standing up, some would fall. And here we're just gonna put in uh, a dead tree and squash it to try and make it look like it's roots that have ripped out of the ground. And we're just having that tree balance. Oh, and it's just come back up again as soon as I've put the floor in to flatten it. Um, yeah, we're going to try and make it look like it's balancing on the branches of the tree that's across the other side of the river. Um, so yeah, that's uh, nice to um, add a bit of character to the forest. And it's just trying to make the ground slope here so it looks like it's going up a bit of a river bank. Make it uh, slope up nicely instead of such a sharp bend. And we're going to put in a few more of these lovely white rocks lovely stuff but yes as I was saying uh, yes the iguanodon uh, could stand on two legs and also uh, possibly run on two legs as well um, if it had to get away from a predator it could uh, run on two legs to become faster or possibly maybe even gallop with all four legs but the, the front legs are very small they're not as as large and as powerful as the back legs so it would probably 
uh, just run on two legs if it had to try and run away from a predator. Most hadrosaurs, when you see them running away from a predator, they do run on two legs. Um, so the, the front arms are mainly just uh, there for when they're grouse, uh, browsing off the, off the uh, floor. So yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it can do either. It can run on two legs or it can walk on four legs. Uh, it can switch it up a little bit. And uh, here what we're going to do is have a nice uh, viewing platform. A uh, nice area where the guests can get a nice view of the entire enclosure. I'm just going to put some uh, fencing here to make sure the guests uh, don't fall off. Um, and a few more Norfolk trees there. And we're going to put in a nice path. Oh no we're not, we're going to do that in a bit. We're going to put some benches in first. Lovely. So you can have a nice sit down and just watch the dinosaurs uh, walking with a nice lake in the background beautiful and what we'll do here is this um, waterfall that's coming down we'll have another stream and then we'll have a nice bridge crossing for the guests to uh, cross over that bridge and get to the viewing platform so let's talk a little bit about this dinosaur let's get a few facts up about it because it's quite a well-known dinosaur uh, it was a very uh, early dinosaur to be discovered and it's probably most well known because of the mistake that was made when it was discovered um, its most famous um, attribute should we say is its thumb spike but this at the beginning when it was first found was mistaken to be a nose horn so um yes when they first put it together they thought it had a big rhinoceros horn on the on the front of its nose and no it wasn't it was actually a thumb spike i can see why they thought that because when you first dig up an animal when you find this big sharp thing uh you may mistake it and think well, where's that gonna go well it must be a horn so just put it on the tip of the the animal's nose um and you can actually find um uh, a model in Crystal Palace Park, I believe it is in London, uh, where they have reconstructions, where they've made a, a life-size model of the animal, and it just shows you how far we've come when it comes to uh, the accuracy of dinosaurs. Um, the model looks like nothing like the real creature. Um, it looks like a huge iguana, um, that's its toe its tail is very sloped down dragging on the floor um, its body is completely incorrect and it has uh, this nose horn on it um, so yeah that's in Crystal Palace Park so that's probably what made this dinosaur quite well known and also because it's probably because it was actually the second dinosaur I just found it here in my notes it was the second dinosaur ever to be discovered uh, the first was Megalosaurus, um, and the second was Iguanodon. So I think there's actually Megalosaurus as well, um, uh, models in Crystal Palace Park as well. Um, and when these creatures were first found, the Megalosaurus, they thought it was this giant beast that was roaming England, killing people, like a, a giant dragon or something, some monster. Uh, because back then, nobody knew what a dinosaur was, you know, nobody knew that there were beasts that used to roam the land, you know, long before mankind. And uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Oh, here we're just putting in a nice little cafe, nice restaurant for the guests, uh, the Riverside Caf. So you can um, come have something to eat. We're gonna do a nice little outside bit here for, uh, oh, there we go, get some tables and chairs uh, for the guests to just sit outside by the stream. They can eat their lovely lunch while listening to the water uh, running over the rocks. How peaceful, how lovely. Um, but yeah, um, it's also probably well known, very well known, this dinosaur, uh, the Iguanodon from uh, Disney's movie Dinosaur. Um, quite an old film, this now. This is when I, I remember this coming out when I was a child. Um, and anything that was dinosaur when I was a kid, I used to absolutely love. So when this one came out, I was uh, 
I was very excited. And uh, it's, it's a brilliant film, very, very good film. And Iguanodon doesn't just star in it, but Iguanodon is actually the main character. And uh, the main character was called um, Aladar, Aladar the Iguanodon. Very nice name for an Iguanodon, that, isn't it? And um, yes, uh, it starts off. I remember this, um, this scene was a, a very good way to, to begin the movie. Um, he's not even born yet, he's just an egg. And this egg gets stolen by an egg napper, and the egg napper runs off with this egg, and then it drops the egg, scrapping with another oviraptor, and falls into the river. And then the egg's floating about in the river, going past loads of different dinosaurs, and then you see a pterodactyl uh, come down and steal the the egg, and she tries to take it back to her babies uh, at her nest, and then there's a fight between other pterodactyls trying to get it off her and she drops it and then the egg falls into the forest and then you see these they look like lemurs uh, or some kind of primate and they find the egg and it's like an alien's landed into there um, I'm sure it's on an island as well so they haven't seen any dinosaurs and they're like oh my god what is this what is this thing that's come from the sky um, but yeah they end up raising him and um, yeah it's, it's a great film and what I liked about that film as well is it wasn't the classic, you know, T-Rex as the villain. Um, we have uh, Carnotaurus in that uh, film, and my god, the Carnotaurus in, um, in Disney's Dinosaur was absolutely terrifying. Um, this animal was huge. Um, yeah, not, not a, it didn't grow that big in real life, but in this film it was a monster. Um, but yeah, it was a fantastic film. It came out in 2000, flipping heck. So that's over 20 years ago. I can't believe that. God, time flies. But yeah, it was a, it was a smashing film. It was really, really good. And I, I don't think we've seen Iguanodon actually in uh, the movies. Um, it hasn't had a main role like it did in Disney's Dinosaur. I think we did see one, a uh, glimpse of one in Jurassic World. I think there's one that comes over to the um, the sleeping Giganotosaurus and it wakes up and then it clears off and then the T-Rex decides to have a fight with the with the Giga even though they weren't round at the same time which was a bit unusual but I suppose it's just the movies isn't it um, but yeah um, so that's the only screen time it's got really in the in the movies uh, we have seen it in um, shows uh, like um, Walking with Dinosaurs we see one we see one with the Utah Raptor uh, hunting them that's a brilliant scene um, yeah the Utah Raptors are on the rocks peering over the herd and then they just sprint after the Iguanodon and uh, yeah hunt it down really really good scene um, but yeah we're just uh, putting in some shade here for the guests. I think they'd be a little bit uh, hot here on this on this cliffside. Just looking down, they might they might get a bit warm. So we're just putting in a bit of a shade for them and some binoculars there as well, so they can get a good view of the uh, the iguanodon. So let's uh, have a little a few more facts about this animal. Um, some scientific facts now, not the movies. Let's look at some things about this animal, what it was like in real life. Okay, so let's see what we've got. Ah, but first, uh, we're just gonna put this little outside eating area um, with a nice little canopy over the top. So I wanna put some ivy growing over here, uh, just so you can still sit outside, but you can have a bit of shade if you want. I know the table and chairs have got umbrellas, but you're probably gonna get a lot more shade under here. And I also think it just adds a bit of character to the to the cafe. And what I wanted to do as well, which I think will be nice, is just put some fairy lights at the top. Um, I think it'll add a bit more character to it, you know, a bit more ambiance. Um, oh, and of course, don't forget to put the railings on so that nobody trips and falls off it. But yeah, and uh, we'll put plenty of seating area here for the guests to to sit and enjoy their lunch. Or the tea, when at whatever time they come here, who knows? Oh, and this, I'm just going to put in a wall, um, and that wall is going to be 
basically like where you can go up and get um, sauces or cutlery or something like that. Uh, and then here we have the ivy going on the top. Lovely. And we'll have some bits dangling down in the corners. Lovely stuff. I think that looks rather nice. I think it just adds a bit of character to the building. And there's the fairy lights there. Lovely. Lovely stuff. Uh, so yes, let's uh, let's have a look at what we have in store fact-wise about these, these dinosaurs. Oh well, it seems that the first one has proved me wrong already. I, um, I have called this dinosaur a hadrosaur so many times and it seems that I have been wrong in doing so. Um, Iguanodon is actually not a hadrosaur. It is closely related, which you, you can definitely tell it, it looks it looks just like a hadrosaur, but actually uh, Iguanodon was the largest and best known and most widespread of all the Iguanodontids. Um, so the Iguanodontidae family. Um, Wow, okay, so this must have branched off the hadrosaur family um, and gone its own way, became its own different species, in fact the most successful species of any dinosaur arguably, uh, because it colonised every single continent uh, and it reigned for a very long time as well from the late Jurassic to the early Cretaceous, so it, it wasn't just around in one period of time, it actually overlapped into the other one. I and mean, as you can see, I'm just putting another waterfall, I, I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're just going to put this one in here, uh, dropping from another level, um, so the guests have a nice waterfall to look at as they as they eat. But yeah, it's it's very interesting dinosaur. Uh, could it possibly be down to those thumb spikes, I wonder? Um, you've got to wonder why it was so successful. Um, maybe it was, maybe these thumb spikes were very effective at defending itself. Um, you know, it, it's mad, isn't it? When you look at dinosaurs, the herbivores, the weapons they have to come up with in order to try and survive against these incredible predators. They come up with so many different variations, you know, we have clubs on the end of tails, horns on the head, bony frills to try and protect the neck, um, armor plates, whip tails, and then we have these huge thumb spikes. Um, it would be very interesting to see how they were used. Um, they've got to be for weapons, they really do, and you know, you've got to think of the immense power if they were to swing their hand um, towards a predator and it's a lot bigger than I thought it would be when, when I've looked on this game and uh, looked at skeletons they're very very large and you've got to also think as well that's just the bone on top of the bone you would have had keratin a layer of keratin so that the bone isn't just how big it would have been in real life it would have actually been bigger so you know one swing from those um, spikes if it if it got a predator in the neck or uh, you know, jabbed it somewhere, even got it in the eye or something like that. It, it's incredibly dangerous uh, for a predator to, to deal with. So if you were taking on such a beast, you'd probably want to um, you'd probably want to take it on from behind. You'd want to try and get it from the back. If you're taking it on from the front, you're probably going to get swung out with those with those spikes. Um, oh, and here you can see I'm just putting in a little. Uh, shop at the side, a little kiosk, maybe just selling a few um, souvenirs for the guests. I like the little toys and things. You can see a little animite uh, fossil there. I think that's good. Nice little bit of attention to detail there. And I'll just put a bench here. I think. Oh no, we're not. I'm going to put a sign. This can be the menu um, for people to look at uh, of what they they got on that day. What's on the menu? Um, and you can also see I've also put um, the walls, I've made the walls stone at the bottom and wood at the top. I think that just makes sense, the, the foundation is a bit stronger um, than the, the wood that's above it. And we'll have some ivy growing over that. In fact, I do change the door of this later on. I think uh, rather than having to build all the inside, I just put see these windows here. Uh, they're blacked out, so you can't actually see inside the building. 
Uh, so if you ever want to build something and you don't want to do the inside of it, uh, you just want to do the shell, um, you can do it with these blacked out windows. Um, oh, and here, what we're going to do is, this is how you get up to the cliffside. So what I want to do is have a stone path uh, walking up, um, almost like walking up the cliffs, as if it was dug out of the cliff. Um, and maybe bits of the cliff that were dug out were used to make these steps. Uh, that's why I've gone with stone steps, so it just suits the, uh, you know, the cliff kind of environment. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna make this curve down here, and then we're gonna have a wooden uh, walkway that's gonna take you up to this area. So yeah, I just need to try and fill this bit in with the, You've got to try and make the stones and the rocks look like it's natural but also been carved out um, for a walkway to go up there. So it's just trying to make sure that it all uh, slots in nicely. Lovely. So uh, yeah, getting back onto those thumb spikes though. Um, it says here that some scientists believe that these were not actually used as uh, weapons, but actually used as tools, uh, which is interesting, um, for possibly stripping foliage from uh, branches and uh, maybe also breaking into seeds. Hmm. Um, I don't see why not. In fact, I don't see why not. They could be multi-purpose, so they could be used as weapons as well as um, you know, uh, cracking open seeds, maybe even digging up for some roots or something, something in the ground that's growing. Um, yeah, very interesting that. Um, maybe this is a reason why they did so well as well. Maybe this is a contributing factor. Not only could they, they defend themselves with these spikes, but also get food that maybe other animals couldn't get to. Maybe there were nuts and seeds that other animals struggled to get to. Um, Whereas the Iguanodon was equipped to get this food, it was uh, adaptable. Um, maybe in times where the, there was not much food, the Iguanodon could get to certain foods that other animals couldn't get to, possibly. Uh, but yeah, these thumb spikes, they measure up from, uh, it rain, they range, it says, from two to six inches long. Now, two inches is quite small, but six inches, whew, you won't want to get hit by that. You won't want to uh, get stabbed with one of these spikes, definitely not. But yeah, nonetheless, this animal uh, is a formidable creature. You wouldn't want to uh, uh, come across it in the wild. It might have one swing uh, with those powerful arms. It could definitely do some damage. You know, sometimes the herbivores, they don't get the credit that they deserve. Sometimes it's always the carnivores, you know, oh, they've got big sharp teeth and they're very fearsome and they're, they're dead scary. You know, herbivores, when you think about it, you know, sometimes they're more fearsome than the carnivores themselves. Um, you know, look at herbivores today that you wouldn't want to come across like buffalo and bison, moose. Um, you know, elephants, they'll charge at you, you know, trample over people and stuff like that. They're incredibly dangerous animals. Um, sometimes even more dangerous because a predator sometimes will look at you and think, oh, I'm, I'm not going to bother. I, you know, I, I understand that it's not worth the risk. But some um, of the herbivores, if they see you as a threat, they'll charge at you and stampede at you and just trample over you. And most of them are bigger as well. You know, they're very big animals. Um, so, you know, these herbivores, they're, they're, not to be, uh, they're not to be messed with. You know, we sometimes look at them and think, oh, that's a, a vegetarian one. You know, that one doesn't eat meat, so that one's safe. I, you know, if you were to walk in front of one of these iguanodon and it saw you as a threat, it, you know, that could be your last day. It could just charge at you and that would be it. And heaven knows about the sauropods. I mean, the sauropods, imagine if that thing charged at you, flipping heck. And you know, you think, oh, well, it's quite big. You might be able to get away. Well, look at hippos. You know, hippos are very, very large and they can run very, very fast. 
you know, I think most people in Africa, in fact, yeah, I'm sure this is true, that most people in Africa uh, die from hippos. That's the number one animal, the most dangerous animal in Africa. More people die from hippos than any other animal. So that just shows, you know, you'd, you'd think it'd be lions or something like that. Or, you know, most people die from lions, but no, in fact, it actually is the hippopotamus. So, you know, these herbivores, they're not to be messed with, I'm telling you. Um, so we must make sure that our guests are kept safe. So what I'm making sure here is that we uh, don't make this platform. At first I put it in, I thought that is too low. Iguanodon will literally be able to stand up on its two uh, back legs and probably, you know, if it wanted to, it could get to the guests. Uh, so that's when I started thinking, hmm, I need to put it up a bit higher because the last thing we want is an injured guest. So yeah, <laughs> um, just got to make sure that everything is safe in this enclosure. We don't want any accidents. And here, just under this uh, little shelter, just to uh, get the guests out the sun and into the shade a little bit, uh, we're going to put uh, some TVs on the wall here. Um, and on these TVs, we're going to have um, some information telling the guests about the Iguanodon and uh, so showing some pictures of the Iguanodon and some videos on there as well. Um, maybe if these animals, maybe it's not in breeding season at the time that the guests are here, uh, but if we've got shots of the Iguanodons nesting or when they last hatched, we could show these videos on the TVs and uh, tell the guests, you know, this was the last breeding season and, uh, you know, just tell the guests a little bit about the animal uh, in the exhibit and a few bins as well to keep the zoo nice and tidy and then we're just going to put some logs in here uh, for a bit of support just so it looks like the you know it wouldn't fall down and I think that I mean I don't know I'm looking at it now and thinking hmm is that tall enough I think health and safety would be like no we're shutting you down um, it needs to be taller because uh, I'm just looking at him there and I'm, I'm just imagining him on his back legs um, Whenever one went up on their back legs while I was building this, I'd click on them and then put them in position next to the to the platform. But when I did it, the game, something with the uh, mechanics of the game, he goes back down and s just stands on all four legs. So I couldn't get an idea if um, you know what he, how high it would be uh, when he stood up. Uh, so yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just hoping that that's high enough. And here we're just doing the backdrop, just a few trees, just to make you feel like you're, you know, in, in this environment, a nice uh, big forest in the these rocky mountains. And then we'll take this trail off uh, through the forest, and this will take you to another section of the zoo. Ah, and here we are at a different section of the zoo. Um, yeah, sometimes when you're building on one area of the zoo and you've been doing it for a while you can get a little bit of tunnel vision so sometimes i think it's just good to take a little break and come back to it later because sometimes you you're trying to figure out where to go and you're thinking does this look right or should i move it here so um yeah i'm just coming over here to uh build this little hide um apologies about that if that's a bit uh, annoying to you know we're working on one section then we go to another one um, but I just feel like I needed a bit of a, a break from that area and uh, a lot of the times when I've been doing this build I, I did have a plan of what I was going to basically do but uh, there was a few changes along the way so I build something and then I thought actually that looks so much better if I move it over here or I do it over here instead um, so we did have a few changes in this habitat, uh, but in the end, I do think it looks a lot better. Lovely. So it's uh, it's coming together now. We've just got to finish off this little hide, and I do love putting hides into uh, habitats. I think it's uh, it's good for the guests. You know, they get to see the animals behaving naturally, and uh, it's also good for the animals because they get a bit of privacy as well. They don't know they're being watched. Um, so yeah, I think that's really good uh, for both sides, really. I'm just going to blend it in here with a few bulrushes on either side. 
um, just to blend it in a little bit more so it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb and put some rocks down here we don't want one area of the exhibit to be too rock heavy uh, we want to make sure that we spread out those rocks if, if you've got a rocky habitat there should be rocks you know popping up everywhere not just one side of the enclosure otherwise it'll look a little bit odd um, um, so yeah you can see there's a door there coming out of the hide but actually we're just going to have this hide uh, only coming in from one side um, so rather than looping all the way around the other side of the enclosure uh, we're just going to have you walking one way through it um, I think it works out better uh, for the for the whole thing it just looks a lot better for, and, it, and it's better for the iguanodon they get more space um, just going to put some windows in here with some reinforced glass. I was wondering whether to have the top open, um, but if there's people in there being a bit noisy. I know you're supposed to be quiet and hide, but uh, uh, yeah, I think it's just better to have the whole thing uh, solidly secured in there. With a few benches and again some TVs uh, giving you some information about these extraordinary animals. So yeah, now here's where we were trying to, f I was trying to figure out what fence to use. Um, what is suitable for an iguanodon? Definitely not that wooden one. Um, but that wooden one is for the guests. That is to keep the guests behind the fence that's for the iguanodon. So the iguanodon get their own fence and the guests get their own fence. Um, one is to keep the guests from putting their hand through. And the other one is to stop the iguanodon from attacking the guests so um, yeah we need both just to ensure everyone's safety oh, and here what I'm doing is I'm just gonna put in um, a little section where the rough water meets the calm water but they won't mix um, so I can't just join them together so what I'm gonna do here is just put some rocks down uh, a log and then just put a bit of splashes down and that makes it look like the water's flowing through that creek and coming into the lake uh, and here I'm just putting in uh, a new entrance to the uh, Riverside Cafe before I had um, clear glass and you could see inside that it was empty and I thought I don't really want to build the whole of an inside of a of a cafe um, instead I can just put that that uh, black glass in and you can't see in then and it looks like it's an actual building but you don't have to uh, bother with the inside bits uh, and here we're just going to put a bit more um, details to the backdrop so just so it looks a bit more thicker with a few more trees you know to really immerse you in this dinosaur valley you know so when you look around you see forest surrounds you and these rocky cliffs lovely oh and here we're back to that uh, wooden walkway through the forest um, what I've done here is just put this piece of rock standing up for a bit of support and we're gonna attach the uh, wooden walkway to it so there's gonna be a nice little oval shape going around the rock and we've deleted some of the rocks that I put down there originally uh, that's now gonna be another way that the dinosaurs can walk underneath the um, the walkway so they can get from the other side and they can come from this way as well so yeah lovely it's coming together now it's looking rather nice if i do say so myself uh, but yes let's have a little look at some more uh, facts and information about the iguanodon so let's get the uh, the measurements up what does this animal uh, what is the size of this creature uh, well, the length, we've got uh, measurements of up to 10 meters long, um, which is pretty big, uh, <laughs> very long animal. Um, you know, T-Rex is 12 meters. I always compare things to T-Rex, it's just because T-Rex is so universally well known. Um, you know, when you say, oh, 10 meters, T-Rex is 12, it's only two meters shorter than a Tyrannosaur. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big animal. Uh, the uh, iguanodon and weighs up to five tons so yeah it's, it's quite a, a chunky heavy animal um, yeah it's big and height wise 3.5 to 4 meters tall so it's a it's a tall animal as well but uh, I've just been reading here 
Uh, interestingly, it says, um, you know, they can grow between nine to 10 meters. However, uh, much larger bones have been discovered, um, which suggests that some specimens could have reached up to 13 meters long. Now, that's actually longer than a Tyrannosaur. Um, so that's interesting. And when you think about it, you know, Iguanodon, uh, like we've seen before, you know, that they colonized every continent. So there would have been many different subspecies. And uh, depending where you live depends what you look like because you have to evolve and adapt to that environment. So, you know, if an Iguanodon had plenty of food and lots and lots of, you know, vegetation to feed off it could have grown into a giant but uh whereas there may be some places in the world where you know there's there's droughts or seasonal changes or maybe just not a, as much food in some areas so those couldn't grow as big so you know it is interesting we, we see this on um prehistoric planet actually with one hadrosaur uh, that's living on an island the ones that are getting eaten by the giant pterosaurs um they're actually dwarfed and the reason they're dwarfed is because they're living on an island and uh, because they're on an island there's not as much food for them to eat so they start to shrink in size um, over generations and generations they can't keep themselves as large as their cousins on the mainland in the continents um, and in fact I remember seeing this on I think it was was it planet dinosaur I can't remember but there was there was also a dwarf sauropod and they, they grew to the size of ponies um, you know it's mad when you think about a sauropod you think of something huge and this little thing just grew to the size of a pony just because there's not enough vegetation for it to um, to eat and the pterosaurs actually hunted them the pterosaurs were hunted I think it was uh, the same ones it may have been Quetzalcoatlus or maybe it was the ones off um, Prehistoric Planet, I forget its name now, is it ha Haxiopteryx, I think? Um, but yeah, oh, them birds are, are lethal. But uh, I don't think they'd be taking on an Iguanodon, um, I doubt that. I think an Iguanodon is a little bit too large uh, for those to take on. But that is interesting, um, you know, maybe there are some, some species out there um, that haven't been found they've only found bones that are larger so they haven't found a full skeleton um, but it just shows you you know there's, there's a lot out there to discover um, when it comes to you know prehistoric life to think that what we found is the you know the largest even when we think of like the largest individuals think of uh, the largest tyrannosaurus rex that we've discovered that's not the largest one that ever lived it's the largest one we've discovered so you know there could be bigger in fact it's probably more um, realistic to believe that we haven't found the largest you know when you think of the largest tyrannosaurs we've ever discovered um, Sue held the throne for a very long time she was the largest t-rex that we'd ever discovered um, that we'd ever known of uh, until she uh, was overtook she was um, overtook by Scotty um, the largest T-Rex that's ever been discovered now um, and I think he's only a little bit longer than that. I think he's like nearly 13 meters long um, and a bit more robust but he is the largest T-Rex now that's ever been uh, discovered but Sue I'd probably say is a bit more well known um, she's very famous um, because she held the title for so long of, of the largest Tyrannosaur um, I think a skeleton is in Chicago Museum, I believe, in, uh, in America. And they've also built uh, a reconstruction of a life-size model of her. That's how famous she is. Um, if you haven't seen that model, um, it's been built by uh, Blue Rhino Studios. Um, definitely worth taking a look. I'd love to go and see the real thing, um, you know, up close in real life. Uh, it's probably the closest you'll get to standing next to a life-size dinosaur um, but yeah it's it, it's a really good model a lot of detail in it very paleo accurate um, in fact it's so accurate they've actually put on um, injuries on the on the dinosaur 
when you look at her bones, uh, it looks like she's got some kind of, I can't remember if it's a crack in the bone or if the bone was swollen where it possibly could have got infected or something. Um, but yeah, they, they've actually put on the on her leg, I think it's her left leg, um, they put a, a scar there. Now goodness knows how this happened, how she got this scar. Maybe she was fighting with a herbivore and it got the better of her or possibly it was uh, another Tyrannosaur that she was fighting with. So yeah, who knows, but they're, they're very good at um, uh, Blue Rhino Studios. They built a few life-size models. Um, oh, here we're just putting in a, a bridge that's gonna connect from the other side, taking you up to the, the other side of the cliffs. Um, was it originally supposed to be going one big loop you can see the fencing there that I put in um, that was going to take you all the way around the enclosure but I think it's better just as a walk through um, you know just walking in just passing through the exhibit rather than going all the way around it um, I think it just works a lot better this way with this particular enclosure anyway lovely stuff so we're just putting in a nice curved platform to uh, take you up to those cliffs just like on the other side you know try and balance out the exhibit try and mirror it a little bit you know add a little bit of feng shui to the enclosure and I like how it just flows through nice and curved through the through the cliff and through the trees to really immerse the the guests in the enclosure and we'll just put that bridge on now. This is going to take you out of the enclosure to the next section of the zoo. And we'll just put in some logs for a bit of support. And then just tilt some on the side. You see this in some bridges sometimes, you know, for a little bit of a support for the bridge. We don't want the bridge to collapse now, do we? So, you know, we need to make sure that it's uh, very sturdy. And then just a few more here sticking into the rock just on an angle just to look like support beams lovely but uh where was i i was talking about um blue rhino studios so yeah they've not only built a tyrannosaurus rex uh, based off sue uh, but they've also built uh, many other different prehistoric animals not just dinosaurs as well um, they've done pterosaurs they've built a, a life-size quetzalcoatlus uh, they've done one on the ground um, stood up and then they've also done one in flight as well I think they've hung it up uh, in a museum I think that's also in Chicago Museum as well um, and I think Sue is but I know that she was on tour for a while I think that or unless it was a, another model they might have got you know they might have not just built one they might have a few uh, I'm not sure but uh, yeah they're ve very good very good models they've also done uh, I think a Basilosaurus a life-size Basilosaurus uh, just you know hung up as if it's swimming and they've also done a woolly mammoth that one was a really good one uh, and also short-faced bear as well stood up you, it's massive it really gives you a sense of how big that animal is uh, but I don't think they've done an iguanodon uh, I think they have done an, an Edmontosaurus or some sort of hadrosaur but they haven't done an iguanodon so maybe an iguanodon could be on their list I, I do hope they do make a I mean I want them to make everything to be honest <laughs> I just want them to make loads of different uh, models and you can just walk into a, a museum and just see you know tons of different life-size animals as they would have been but uh, yeah uh, it's definitely worth checking them out anyway that's enough about that uh, let's actually talk about the animal that we're making this build for the iguanodon one second let me just get a, a sip of my drink ah that's better uh, so yes, let's have a look at a bit more facts about the Iguanodon. Now this might be quite surprising to some of you, but um, Iguanodon is one of the, in fact, the first dinosaur uh, to be able to chew. Uh, which is very interesting because most dinosaurs, in fact I think, I think all of them actually, um, don't chew their food. Um, they just strip off vegetation with their, with their teeth. 
and swallow it whole and then um, especially you may have seen this with sauropods they swallow stones and these stones grind the vegetation up inside their gut uh, because they don't have the time to be able to chew their food and they don't have the ability to do it either their jaws won't let them do that uh, but iguanodon do but it's a very odd way of chewing their food it's not like we do um, so it says here um, it remained a bit of a mystery of how they chewed uh, in order to accomplish this the animal needed cheeks uh, now living reptiles don't have these it says however the iguanodon skull shows that its teeth were on the inside of the jaw so when you think of a jawbone the teeth are on the top of that jawbone but with the uh, iguanodon it shows that they're actually uh, inside uh, on the sides of the jaw um, which is quite odd so that means that it's got more space here to actually chew its food it's actually got cheeks uh, it says thus it left room for skin covering acting as cheeks uh, the second mystery was grinding uh, mammals have their jaws horizontally um, what's this saying mammals move move their jaws horizontally sorry um, to accomplish this uh, however iguanodon can only move its jaw vertically um, they overcome this by having a hinge that allows their jaw to flex mm, okay uh, and pushing its lower jaw up inside uh, the upper jaw allows the teeth to grind together ah so i see what it's doing so basically uh, the lower jaw must be a little bit smaller and as it's pushing its jaw up it's actually the teeth because they're on the sides rather than on the top and you think about when we chew our teeth go together these teeth are actually sliding past one another so they're actually grinding the vegetation up and then it's got rooms at the side of its uh, jaw those cheeks for all the vegetation to you know break down and mush it up and then it can actually swallow it uh, once it's chewed it up enough and maybe this is a reason why it was one of the most successful dinosaurs to ever live because it's actually taking the time to chew its food uh, it may not have been able to grow massive like a giant sauropod you know that didn't take the time to chew its food at all it literally just strips the food off swallows it whole and then lets the um, the stones do the work for it um, but with iguanodon it's actually taking the time to chew its food which is very interesting um, in fact we see this in walking with dinosaurs I'm sure there's a clip where the iguanodon are actually chewing you can see them moving their jaws back and to and you can see like they've tried they, they have an anim animatronic model where they're moving the puppet back and to and you can see that they've tried to make cheeks on that model as well so it looks like it's actually eating uh, you know it's actually trying to grind the food up in its mouth before swallowing it so yes this this is very interesting the first dinosaur to chew so maybe there's more because it doesn't say the only dinosaur to chew it says the first so possibly there are others uh, but yes so there you go the first dinosaur to chew the iguanodon very very interesting lovely so the build's coming on now all this walkway is pretty much done the bridge is done uh, but you can see where the steps go down there to loop back round um, the enclosure all that is going to be gone in a minute um, all that will be deleted and we're just going to have this bridge walk to the next area of the zoo um, put in a few trees here just for a backdrop the Norfolk trees and the redwoods go together very well even though they're on different biomes and then these lovely little bushes just as if they're growing out the cracks of the rocks lovely oh and it seems here some more information here that it wasn't just the iguanodon that could chew it didn't say the only did it said the first dinosaur so we do have a few more but not many to be honest uh, we have Iguanodon, the Centrosaurus, which is a type of Ceratopsian. Um, 
the Probactosaurus, Probactrosaurus, yes, uh, that's a type of hadrosaur, and the Edmontosaurus, the very well known Edmontosaurus, and it says other hadrosaurs as well. Uh, chewed plants with their grinding back teeth. Uh, they probably had cheeks to prevent the food from falling out of their mouth during chewing. You certainly don't want that, do you? All the food falling out your gob as you're trying to uh, chew it up. Oh, and here is the moment that I decided to delete that path going through the middle. I looked at this forest that was just supposed to be a backdrop at first, and then I thought, you know what, it's too nice of a forest. Uh, so I delete the fence, and I decide to give this to the Iguanodons, a nice, lovely forest to explore. Just get rid of that, blend it in a bit more where the path was. Um, yeah, when I put it in, I just thought it looks too nice just for the guests to look over and go, oh, a nice forest. It just seems like, uh, you know, I think also as well, when you're looking up from the view from the cliffs, it looks a lot more natural and it just looks a lot better to look over the lake and just see that forest in the background with the iguanodon, you know, drinking from the other side or grazing uh, from the, the forest branches, rather than just seeing a great big dirty path going right through the middle of the, uh, the landscape. It looks a lot nicer. So I'm just gonna put a bit of um, this uh, material down here, this um, terrain, just to make it look like bits of leaves and twigs and stuff have fell down. Um, and covered the forest floor, you know, but I'm just trying to blend it in a little bit with the with the sand It can be quite hard sometimes you've got to make sure you, you don't put it on too high of a density or else it just You know, it's very um, Quick to fill it all in with that one texture you're putting in so you've got to put it on a you know Quite a medium one and just quickly press with your mouse and just get used to it um, But yeah I think it looks a lot better that and then we'll just fill in a bit more of those reeds there and I think I put the rest of the iguanodon in there I have yes so we've got 30 individuals now a nice big enclosure for them a nice forest for them to forage from you can see how thick it is there um, and also it's a nice place for them to get uh, you know some shelter if the Sun's a bit hot they can go into the forest and get some shade oh, and here we're just gonna get rid of that section that went down the steps. What I'll do instead will have a little bit of a platform, a viewing area where they can, so they can still come over here and get a nice view, uh, but it just won't be going down to the, uh, to the path. So yeah, I rather like this. I like, I think it looks a lot better this way, uh, even though I planned for it to originally, you know, going around in one big circle. I think it does look a lot nicer this way. And then we've just got to fill in that gap there. I can see a big hole there where the, where the rocks are. There we go, that's better. Lovely. And a few rocks that have fell off the cliffs. And a few supports uh, to make it look nice and sturdy. Lovely. Put some lovely benches in there. Just to have a sit down and have a look at this incredible view of the lake and the forest in the background as the dinosaurs graze across the landscape beautiful so just got to try and fit in the background now try and make this look like it's a big rocky cliff that goes off even though it's not part of the enclosure we're just trying to make it uh, look like it all blends in really immerse the guests in this type of habitat so yeah the iguanodon now this creature you may think you know it's not to be messed with this big animal with this massive thumb spike you don't want to mess with that no one would mess with it you'd think but there were creatures that did mess with iguanodon they did take it on and they viewed iguanodon as lunch and it may be hard to believe you know this animal these huge thumb spikes you know a big animal as well a very powerful animal but there were creatures that would have hunted Iguanodon and Iguanodon lived on every single continent and for such a wide range of time so there were many different creatures that hunted Iguanodon um, one of them being a very well-known dinosaur the Giganotosaurus uh, this was argued to be one of the largest carnivores on earth at one point 
Um, some believe even bigger than Tyrannosaurus Rex. I think though now uh, most people think that Tyrannosaurus Rex was a lot more stockier. It might not have been as long, but it was a much more stockier and heavier animal and had a much more uh, higher bite force. But yes, the Giganotosaurus would have hunted Iguanodon. Uh, they lived in South America with these creatures. And uh, if you've ever watched Walking with Giants, where uh, Nigel Marvin goes back in time to go and see some uh, Argentinosaurus, he comes across the Iguanodon. They're running around. One, one he meets, I think, that's injured. It's been attacked by a Giganotosaurus. And then later on you see him uh, find a Giganotosaurus that's brought down an Iguanodon. And it actually picks up the Iguanodon with its mouth. I'm, I'm sure that was a baby though. It must have been a, a juvenile to, to bring that up. I remember when I first saw that, I thought this animal was enormous. Because when he said, oh, it's bigger than T-Rex. I think that's where I first heard about Giganotosaurus watching that program. I was like, oh my god, look at the size of Igu Iguanodon to the Giganotosaurus, it's literally picked it up in one bite. Uh, so I thought this animal was huge, and then I realized, oh, you know, it's big, but it's not as uh, as big as I was, uh, you know, as I thought it was when I watched that program. But that was a brilliant program. I love watching those with Nigel, um, the Giant Claw as well. That was a great TV program. Uh, but yeah, we get to see the Iguanodon and the Giganotosaurus. Um, in that program together so you know they would have definitely um, crossed paths at one point and uh, you know had fights that would have been quite something to see uh, you know a Giganotosaurus trying to take down this brute of an animal and this animal swinging with its thumb spikes it would have been quite amazing because, because you know it's either those are on the menu or you take on the Argentinosaurus and the Argentinosaurus let's face it I think uh, you're only going to take them on if there's a sick individual or it's a juvenile or there's one that's got lost from the herd uh, because they're so enormous you know you're probably going to think do you know what we'll go with the Iguanodon instead but uh, yeah it would have been quite something to witness uh, it would have been an amazing sight to see and behold uh, we also put them into our little documentary prehistoric Patagonia uh, where the you know they have a little fight and they have a, uh, a tussle you know the Giganotosaurus are hungry two brothers looking for a meal and they come across this herd of iguanodon um, but yeah it's, it, it would be so good to see in uh, real life if you haven't seen that uh, documentary that we've made the um, prehistoric Patagonia you can have a look in our little playlist that we've made uh, on Jurassic World Evolution we made it um, I would like to make some documentaries on uh, this game as well uh, I'm just waiting for a bit more uh, animation that we can do you know a bit more hunting animation and behaviors and that's supposed to be coming out this month so I'm just waiting to see what sorts of behaviors we're gonna get it's gonna be very exciting to see uh, because these animals they look gorgeous and some the behaviors they're doing already they look really good I just think we need a little bit more just to bring them to life and they were saying weren't they you know some animals are gonna react different to others so triceratops you know might hold its ground uh, bigger animals may hold the ground you know or some animals might not even be fussed you know you think of an Argentinosaurus it might just be like meh you know I'm not bothered I'm, I'm too big to be bothered about a, a predator walking past uh, but things like Dryosaurus they're probably gonna scurry away and hide um, but it'd be interesting to see when that update comes out and uh, also what I'm very excited for is the Velociraptor I cannot wait to uh, see that animal put on this game it's gonna be absolutely fantastic uh, it should be coming out very soon um, I think sometime in this month so I'm just keeping my <laughs> my ears peeled waiting for when they arrive because when they do it's gonna be oh, it's just gonna be great to see those animals on this game um, but yeah, there would have been other predators as well, not just the Giganotosaurus, there would have been Carnotosaurus. We also had them in the documentary as well in the prehistoric Patagonia. Um, 
the Carnotaurus, the flesh-eating bull, you know, this animal would have um, definitely come across um, iguanodons. And what we thought was that maybe um, the Carnotaurus would have used its, um, its, its horns, you know, on its head as weapons, not only just its bite. Uh, because I think, what are they there, there for? You know, um, they must be there for something. So maybe it could have swung its head to use that to, to add some damage, you know, and uh, try and use that against its prey. But then we obviously have the Iguanodon, you know, give him a taste of his own medicine, and he swings his thumb spike into the, the um, flesh-eating bull. So... Yeah, it would have been it would have been incredible to witness these dinosaurs, you know, fighting. It really would. Oh, and here I'm just going to make a little uh, entrance to the Iguanodon enclosure. So a nice little uh, archway with some logs and two silhouettes on either side of the Iguanodon, uh, and we'll put also the name at the top, just so the guests know what to, you know what to expect, what we've got in store for them. Uh, and get them a bit excited as well, you know, oh, it's the Iguanodon coming up next uh, from wh wherever they've come from in the zoo. We'll just put this uh, little roof on the top and then just copy that over. And when I was doing the letters as well, <laughs> before when I was writing out the Juxia in the Juxia build, I was trying to fiddle with the letters, you know, trying to get them all in line. And I didn't realize you can just put on snapping you can click on a little thing uh, that just snaps them. So as soon as you tilt them, they all just, you know, snap into place. They all face the right way. I thought, God, I wish I knew that earlier because last time when I was building the Juxi, I was trying to get them all, you know, in line. I was like, oh, you know, some were sticking a bit, a bit out, some were a bit off. Um, yeah, it's a lot easier. So I'm, I'm all, you're always learning with this game. You're always uh, finding out easier ways to make your builds uh, better. Uh, oh, and this is the sign. This is where I'm going to put uh, Iguanodon. Now, I've got another animal here that would have definitely hunted Iguanodon. And you may have seen this on Walking with Dinosaurs. It's the one and only... Utah Raptor. Now, on this episode, I think it's on the Ornithocyrus episode. Uh, the Ornithocyrus begins in South America, and you see some iguanodon there walking along the beach, and then he flies across the Atlantic to uh, Europe, where he comes across another herd of iguanodon. But this time, it says, you know, this is a European species. Incredible! You've gone to the other side of the world. And there still are Iguanodon here. So they've completely took over everywhere. Uh, but they're obviously going to be a little bit different because the environment will be a bit different. You know, the, there's going to be different vegetation. Uh, the climate will be different. So they might be varying size or colour. And we see them with a little uh, Polacanthus, little uh, tiny ankylosaur. And he's just hanging around the herd, I think, for a little bit of a protection. Uh, you know, because there's safety in numbers. And, uh, yeah, we see a pack of raptors, uh, Utah raptors, that um, are weighing up this herd. And you might think, why Utah raptors in Europe? But I, I thought that at first, because I thought they were only in North America, in Utah. But it does say here that... Um, Utah Raptors did yom, uh, roam Europe. Uh, God, I'm getting my words all muddled up here. Uh, but yeah, so the Utah Raptor is the largest uh, group from the raptor family. Absolutely enormous, these animals. Um, they're like the size of polar bears. When you think of uh, Velociraptors, um, well, I know they're quite small for what we, um, from what we know now, but even so... Um, even though they may be a bit small, they're still very armed with some very, you know, deadly weapons. You know, these claws on their feet and their hands and incredibly sharp teeth. So even a small Velociraptor, I think, would be able to do some damage to a human being. Uh, but the Utah Raptor is just a raptor on steroids. It's absolutely huge. And it's more than capable of bringing down an Iguanodon, especially 
if it hunted in packs, which um, is believed these raptors did. And in that episode, we see them, you know, trying to hunt down uh, a herd. I'm sure at first uh, they the iguana don't get away. Again, most hunts end in failure, so they show that the iguanodon, you know, managed to, to escape, and their second attempt, they managed to bring one down. And it is quite, you know, it's quite a, 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 a gruesome scene. We see one raptor chase the iguanodon down, and then another one jumps on it. And I think this is why the, you know, the hook, the claws on their hands, they're like meat hooks, so they can grasp onto their prey and their legs uh, you know at the end of their feet they've got these huge uh, curved claws they can just kick with their legs you know causing some severe damage you know cutting into the animal as those uh, hand claws just stable themselves on there and then one of them grabs the throat of the iguanodon you know it's quite a, a gruesome scene you know uh, the scenes in uh, Walking with Dinosaurs, they didn't hold back with violence, you know, they, they'd show you everything. And even later on, they show you eating the animal, you know, they have two puppets just poking their heads in and, you know, tearing out all the, the guts and everything. And there's one uh, individual that's a, a juvenile, I think, and he's waiting to get some scraps. So the two adults are like, no, you know, you, you're at the bottom of the pecking order. You can come and eat when we're finished. And you can see him just waiting around. It's like, please let me eat. They're like, no, no, clear off. We've we've done this hard work of hunting this animal down. You can wait. And that's exactly how it would be. Um, but yeah, it's mad when you think, you know, an iguana, I don't know how big it is. Still, these, uh, these raptors can take them on. So that would have been a you know a very extraordinary hunt to see as well so we've got giggers that are hunting them down we've got um the flesh-eating bull the carnotaurus and we also have the utah raptor very famous very well-known dinosaurs all of these um you know very classic dinosaurs and there would have been plenty of more that's just three well-known dinosaurs you know they they lived for such a long time from the jurassic the late Jurassic to the early Cretaceous, there would have been so many animals that would have fed off this creature. Um, so they're a really big part of the ecosystem, you know, they're food for lots of different animals. Um, oh, here I'm just putting in a little behind the scenes area. I'm imagining that that gate is like a sliding door uh, and there's the keeper's shed where they can, you know, go in and uh, if there's anything they need to deal with, um, with the iguanodon, they can get in that way. Oh, and here I'm just going to put in some bamboo, just to um, so the guests can't see. You know, it makes it look nice as well. It corners off this area quite nicely. And I've tried to do a bit more for the guests this time, um, rather than just focusing purely on the exhibit. I've tried to give them, a, you know, you can see there. I've given them a shop um, and a little cafe and some, you know, a nice feeding area for them to. Uh, you know, have a picnic or pack lunch. Oh, just finishing off that bit there with the uh, the cafe up top. Lovely stuff. So I think we're coming close now to the end. Um, we finally got there. We finally completed the exhibit. Um, this is quite a big build. I think it's one of the biggest ones I've done. Good heavens knows what I'm going to do when I start building enclosures for sauropods. Uh, that should be interesting. Um, because they lived in herds and they're enormous as well so that's going to be quite a, a challenge to build something for that large um, but no I'm, I'm quite happy with this build um, let me know what you think down below uh, let me know in the comments what you think did you like it is there anything you'd like to see added to it or anything that could make it better and if you'd like to see a bit more in-depth look at the enclosure, tomorrow I'll be putting out a tour of the whole exhibit where you can get a bit more of an in-depth look, as if you're a guest coming to visit the enclosure. So thank you all for watching, guys. Please like and subscribe, leave a comment down below, and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.